Good morning, welcome to Keith Packard's ex-community history talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful introduction as always. Um, this morning's talk is completely bling free. I know all of you come to watch the bling, but I've presented absolutely no interesting effects on the screen all week. Um, spent the morning packaging free type. Um, I'm going to talk about how we came to be, how the X community came to be where it is today um, in an effort to try to um, explain what happens uh, through un the unintended consequences of rash and uh, um, hurried action. Thank you. That was rash. Well, let's see if it comes back. Okay. Ooh. Okay, I wanted to talk about where X came from. Uh, X, of course, came from, um, originally came from Stanford, uh, the, uh, uh, the Stanford uh, V group, who were building the uh, v, uh, v kernel, which is a distributed multiprocessing system across the network. Uh, built a graphic system called VGTS, uh, Polycenti eventually turned that into a more formal windowing system called W. They had the V kernel and the W windowing system. Um, eventually that went over to MIT and Bob Schaffler played with that and got it working on Unix and eventually changed it enough that he called it X. Uh, through the era from X1 through X10, it was a kind of a typical university project. There wasn't any particular formal schedule. There wasn't any particular formal requirements for compatibility or anything like that. Every time the protocol changed in an incompatible way, we got a new version number. Uh, one of these numbers doesn't actually exist in reality. X9 was never, it was never actually instantiated. Uh, each version of the Windows system was fixed. There weren't any, ex it wasn't extensible in any way. And so every time they did want to add some new feature like color, uh, they had to change the protocol number. Um, in about 1986, 1987, a bunch of Unix developers, uh, Unix systems vendors, uh, were starting to ship X10 and they discovered that X10 really wasn't going to do what they wanted to do, but they wanted something very much like it. So instead of starting from scratch with an entirely new group of people, they said, well, what, what happens if we just you know, help the development of this project and come up with a new version that's going to be, have a little longer lifetime? Um, but they succeeded beyond their wildest imaginations in that regard. Um, so they actually compl they started completely over. They built a team of, um, of engineers that designed the protocol uh, Digital actually donated an entire staff of people to implement an uh, entirely new uh, X, uh, X server and uh, X library. It was a really wonderful industry. Oh, yeah, I forgot to reset my screen server. I'm sorry. Uh, it was a very, really wonderful example of industry university collaboration in, in, in kind of its best form. The industry provided a lot of manpower. The university uh, uh, provided a lot of intellect. And together, they worked together quite wonderfully. Um, He's laughing at me. Um, we actually had universities, a lot of uni university participation in this era. We had Stanford, we had CMU, we had um, Purdue, we had a lot of other universities involved in the Windows system at this point. There were even community people outside of the university system involved, although they were a lot rarer. It was very hard to get an internet connection um, in this era without university or industry um, connection. <clears throat> Now, one of the interesting things that happened during X development, which is very relevant to what happened uh, politically, um, is, was the collapse of the internet in 1987. Um, how many of you were using the internet in 1987? Yeah, that would be B. Dale and I. <laughs> uh, what happened was, this is pre, uh, pre uh, Van Jacobson slow start TCP implementation. In this era, um, any packet loss, if you lo lost a packet in the middle of a uh, packet stream, the uh, sender would retransmit every packet that it, ha that it uh, hadn't get been act, that had not been act yet. Which is to say, if you lose one packet in the middle of your window, you'd retransmit the entire window. Which was pretty exciting, because that meant as soon as the network started to get a little congested and you started to lose packets, you started to flood the network with packets. Anybody see a, kind of a, the wrong kind of feedback going on here? Yeah, it's a positive feedback loop. And so, as soon as the network started to slow down during any particular day, it would stop dead. There would be effectively no util, u, u, usable net, uh, internet. Um, what X was, uh, the X11 development was going on in the middle of this nightmare. 
And what happened was they stopped being able to communicate between the two major centers of development um, at Digital Research, I mean at uh, Digital Western Research Lab doing the implementation and at MIT doing the specification and, and implementation of the library. So they, all of a sudden their network died. Can you imagine what would happen to Debian if the internet suddenly failed? <laughs> right? Here we are sitting around. You're actually listening to me. Why? Because there's no network. Yeah. So the ex-developers were in a quandary what the heck to do. Well, they started doing the classic days of your uh, time sharing stuff. They would start doing FTPs at 3 in the morning. Fortunately, it was a U.S. The Internet was largely U.S. based at that point. So there really was a, a notion, the diurnal cycle of uh, Internet usage. So you really could take advantage of that and use the Internet at 3 in the morning. And of course, my screen saver fires again. Sorry about that. Um, the other thing it started to do was sneaker net, right? Stick a mag tape of uh, source in a, in, a, in a FedEx envelope and ship it across the country. Fortunately, FedEx still existed, and it wasn't dependent upon the internet like it is today. <laughs> okay, so how did they respond to the uh, failure of the internet? Well, they responded in some very bad ways. They didn't understand that it was a short-term failure. In, even though Van Jacobsen had already demonstrated a successful internet uh, inter uh, operation with a, with a uh, slightly changed TCP implementation. Um, so what they did was they said, well, we can't trust the Internet for our development. Even though we've successfully developed X11 in a distributed fashion, largely using the Internet, we don't believe that we can do ongoing X development, trusting the Internet and doing collaborative distributed development. So they gave up. They gave up by centralizing the development of the X window system at MIT and hiring a bunch of staff. Well, what happens when you hire a bunch of people to do development? Well, it requires a bunch of money, which means you need to go out and collect money from industry people because academics don't have money to donate to this sort of thing. And you have to find developers who are now central, who are now the privileged developers in that community, right? You have people who are paid to work full time on the system and who are located where the source code lives and who grant access begrudgingly to people outside of their cloister. So we moved totally to a cathedral model at this point. Um, of course, the consequence of moving to a cathedral model was that this consortium became addicted to money, right? We had uh, between four and seven developers do the math, right? It took a huge amount of money to run this organization. Um, as a result, the co consortium needed to continue to find sources for funding itself. Um, and so it needed to find ways to incent corporations to become members. Those corporations were granted special privileges, one of which was access to the source code during the development process, not at a release cycle. So the people outside of the corporate world only saw X as these point releases. They didn't see the development process. They couldn't get access to the source code repository. They couldn't contribute to uh, voting on what parts of the system would become the standard. So all of a sudden, we had no collaboration from outside of industry. In fact, all of our academic collaboration disappeared at the same time. Uh, kind of a catastrophe. Our, our community collapsed from this uh, broad spread uh, collection of collaborators from universities and outside of universities and industry. From this partnership, all of a sudden it became a bunch of contract programmers working at MIT for corporate interests. Does that sound like an open source project to you? It didn't feel like it to me at the time. But I was young and naive. What did I know? Um, at about the same time, about 1991 or so, uh, this university student in, uh, in Germany, Thomas Roll, um, was writing X drivers for VGA cards. Of course, PCs being pieces of crap that they were at the time, the X consortium had really no interest in them, right? They were totally uninteresting pieces of hardware. They were not the Unix vendors workstation products. They were, you know, machines sold for multiple thousands of dollars instead of multiple tens of thousands of dollars. So the X consortium as a body was uninterested and that trickled down into the staff of the X consortium at MIT uh, where I was at the time and we were completely, I mean, we just laughed at them. We said, ha ha, trying to run X on a toy like that. How funny. Um, but Thomas was actually very interested in, in putting together and working on this stuff. He'd been doing a lot of stuff on it. It was a pretty cool project. Um, it was really interesting that you could take a $2,000 machine at the time and get a full-fledged Unix with a window system running on it. It was pretty interesting. So what Thomas does is he, he uh, joins up with uh, um, a man car called Mark Snidley, and they put together a consulting company, uh, SGCS. And in order to get 
their code, this VGA drivers, into the uh, Windows system, they join the consortium. The only way that you can get a voice in the X Windows system is to pay money. It's a totally pay for say environment. Um, as a result, because they were paying money, suddenly they had a voice and they could get their code shipped in a free software project. How many of you uh, pay $10,000 a year to get your code shipped in a free software project? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it had happened today. And, and it actually did work. Uh, X386 code was included in X11R5. It was very early, it was very primitive. It wasn't actually all that useful at the time. Um, but of course, ha ha ha, Snidely Graphics Consulting Services had this monkey on their back, $10,000 a year in order to get their code into the Windows system. Because they were paying money for it, they thought there was actual value there. So they put together a uh, commercial product called XIX Inside, which uh, many of you may have heard of. It's a commercial X server for PCs running Unix, um, to, to kind of justify their existence, right? They had to put together this commercial. So Thomas started out as a university student doing free software on his spare time, and he gets sucked into this whole corporate, corporate world and dragged down into this uh, commercial uh, X server. Uh, vendor. And XIs, you know, always eked out a kind of little marginal existence doing X servers and they spent a long time in the late 90s actually bashing the free implementation for being slow and not very well supported. You know, not exactly a great collaborative environment. Not a lot of friends were made during that time between the X386 people and the XI people. Also, uh, where did X386 come from? Haha, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly the same story repeats itself. There's a, a group of people wanting to improve these um, barely usable uh, X drivers for, for PCs. And, you know, they're regular open source developers. They're just having a good time developing free software for their hardware. They're scratching their own itch. They get together and start collaborating on patches for um, X11R5, the th X386 drivers. But they become very frustrated by Thomas and Mark Snidely's uh, company who are not now contributing their patches back to the, uh, back to the X consortium. They've taken all of their X386 code and they made it all closed source. The MIT license allows them to do, to do that. Um, um, but so the X386 people were not able to work with um, X, XI and uh, uh, collaborate, uh, collaborate in the development of this stuff at that point. So they put together a bunch of patches. They actually release a version of X386, X386 1.2e or something, um, and b build the first free software version of a, a largely workable uh, PC, PC uh, Unix-based Windows system. Um, XI and, X, and Thomas Roll and Mark Stindley say, wait a minute, X386, that's our trademark. And so X386 was actually forced to change the name of, their, uh, of, of what they were shipping. And so they chose kind of a pun on X386 uh, and called it X3D6, noting that it was now a freely available distribution. Uh, probably one of the, you know, one of the early, early notions of free software as being a distinct product from, um, from a commercial variant that uh, provides the same functionality. Um, of course, X3D6 is now a bunch of free software developers who have no money. And so what does the X consortium do? They are ignored. Um, and again, in order to try to get their work recognized by the X consortium and inc included in X releases, what do they do? <laughs> they put together a corporation, collect money, and join the X consortium. But unfortunately, because they are not a credible commercial company, they've made their intentions clear. They're just going to be doing free software. This corporate consortium continues to ignore them, even though they're paying money now. So it's not enough to pay the man. You have to pay the man and become the man. You have to play by the rules, you have to pretend you're a corporation and pretend you're interested in making piles of money from free software. So uh, you can imagine how the X3D6 developers felt about this great development, right? They were, they were a happy bunch of campers. Um, the X3D6 project was focused on PC graphics drivers. That was really the work they were doing. They were taking the X-Windows system and they were porting it to, free, to uh, PC Unix systems. Um, of course, when they started, uh, Linux didn't even exist. Um, and so they supported a wide range of, of operating systems, both commercial and free operating systems. Um, it's important to note that they started with commercial operating systems where they had no access to uh, the kernel uh, development process. Uh, commercial Unix systems didn't offer development kits to random developers because, after all, they could get money for that. 
So the FreeD6 developers, X3D6 developers, couldn't actually change the operating system, which is why you see the X Windows system architected the way it is today. The system that we run today doesn't depend upon the kernel for anything, right? It has its own PCI bus remapping logic. It has its own you know, mode setting logic outside of user mode. All that it requires from the kernel is to be able to map devices and execute IO, IO, um, IO operations. It doesn't require anything else from the kernel. If the project were started today, nobody would even ever consider doing it this way. So when you laugh at the X Windows system and you say, why does X3D6 or Zorg at this point do all this stuff in user mode? It's because of this origin. The X3D6 developers were free software developers working in a commercial world and they didn't they couldn't play by the right they couldn't play by the commercial rules. They didn't have the money, they didn't have the resources, and they wanted to be able to release their code for free. Um, the developers for X3D6 were almost entirely uninterested in, in issues beyond the driver environment, right? They were, they were happy little hardware hackers uh, writing drivers for ET4000 cards or whatever they had at the time. Uh, so they were not really all too concerned about toolkits and libraries and network protocols and 3D systems and all this kind of stuff. They really were focused down at the low level. And it's important to remember their interests as we move along in history. So what happened in about 1996 was um, the X consortium finally shut down. Uh, the commercial Unix vendors said, oh, wait a minute, we're not making any money in this environment anymore. Uh, why are we supporting a consortium for this? We really don't want to pay money for this. Uh, so they all kind of walked away. They said, well, you know, X is, X is just going to die. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to disappear because it's a Unix-based technology and we all know the world is running to Windows. Um, but somebody needed to hold the copyrights. So, as usual, in a kind of a casual decision, the X, uh, X um, consortium um, organizers said, well, we'll just pass off the copyrights to the code uh, to the open group and let them, you know, continue to support it so that our existing legacy and dying products will have some kind of tail of support as they exit, uh, exit the market. Well, the open group grabbed onto X and said, oh, wait a minute, these Unix vendors have to ship it. It's part of the Unix standard. Right, if you want to get labeled uh, with TOG as a Unix system, you actually have to support, and you wanted to support X, you have to actually have to cooperate with TOG because they own the, trade, the copyrights now, right? You can't ship the code without their cooperation. So what TOG decides to do is TOG says, you know, we need to support the system for these legacy Unix vendors. We don't want to do it from, for gratis, so we're going to try to extract money from X. So their big plan was to relicense X in such a way that you couldn't have a free software implementation. You actually had to pay for it. Again, because they had to pay staff to maintain the Windows system, they had to have some revenue stream. It wasn't in entirely evil. Um, and so they attempt to relicense X. X11R6 was going to come out with a closed source license that required you to pay uh, money to TOG to ship, uh, ship, ship products compatible with it. Um, fortunately, X was, had been released under the MIT license until then. So x 3 6 said, well, if you ship a closed source version, we will support the uh, old code and not include any of your patches as free software. You know, great in instance of where a free software group was able to successfully force the issue and TOG basically said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll relicense it. But the effect of this was that political control of the X Windows system was very clearly now had moved from these commercial companies into the free software community. The, free, the uh, commercial companies no longer had any political leverage to force license changes in the Windows system. They had no leverage to change how the Windows system op operated. And it was very clear at this point that the free software community had won and that X3D6 was now in de facto control of the Windows system's future. And the problem was, what do the core X3D6 developers want? They want to build drivers. They don't want to own the Windows system. They're kind of frustrated by this whole notion that all of a sudden this huge ball of code is now landed in their laps. We have a question over here. I have one question. How long did the X, X Consortium had its own developers? Uh, the X Consortium had its own developers from 1987, late 1987, all the way until 1996, so about nine years. Um, I was there from uh, 1988 till 1992. Um, it moved out of MIT in 1993 and became a separate organization, but continued to have their own developers until 1997, 1996, at which point it was moved to TOG and the, some, a couple of the developers from the X Consortium moved to TOG as well to continue supporting the X Windows system there. So TOG has actually had um, a, a, a very small number of developers. I don't know exactly when they stopped having any developers working on it, maybe 1990, late 1997. So, okay. So, 
Now we have the free software community in charge of X. We have these legacy Unix vendors still shipping ancient crufty workstations running X. And we have a bunch of PCX server vendors uh, selling X in the Windows market. The, the Unix vendors still need X. They actually still, there is still a market for uh, workstations running Unix that include the X Windows system. They can't just drop support for it. But their market share is not, their market is not expanding radically, right? Anybody recently bought a uh, HP UX workstation? Yeah, none of us. Um, so they, but they needed some way to, yeah, PDL says, okay, so that market's not doing so good. It, it's still a credible market, right? And as long as you don't spend too much money, people are paying a huge premium for Unix workstations because they're way more reliable than our PCs. They're way, they were, until recently, way more powerful. And they had tremendous vendor support, you know, stability, uh, supportability, expandability, all kinds of cool features about Unix workstations that made them valuable in, in certain markets and continue to make them valuable in some markets. So these Unix vendors are making, you know, 30 or 40 percent margins on these products. They don't want to just throw their products in the trash, even though they're having fewer and fewer customers every year. So they still need X. They still need to do some support. So the Unix vendors get, uh, put together, uh, kind of get together and say, well, we need somebody to support X. So they basically, um, they force TOG, because they're still related to TOG, to slightly dissociate the X uh, portion of TOG from TOG, so they have a little more control over it. And then they hire a consulting company to do, uh, to do patches so they can track bugs and fix stuff in a collaborative environment. Classic industry consortium. There's a, there's a shared resource. They're each putting money into the pile so they can each benefit and they don't have to pay all the, all the uh, bug fixing separately. Um, it's still an industry consortium. You pay if you want your bugs fixed. It's not too exciting. Most of the bug fixes come from where? X386, that's right. So the free software developers are now sharing their work with commercial vendors, commercial Unix vendors. Not a lot of, it's basically a one-way street. Our bug fixes happen um, in the X386 world and they trickle down into the uh, X.org environment and the commercial Unix vendors get their bugs fixed basically by hiring the consultant to apply X386 patches. It, they're happy with the, organ, the, with the setup. There's a little political wrangling and some financial machinations going on again because there's enough money there that there's interest from, uh, uh, from third parties to try to extract money from the organization. So there's nasty politics going on. But it's working surprisingly well for them. But it's not doing exactly what they want. Um, okay, so what are the unintended consequences? Oh, what happened here? Did I lose a slide? No, apparently not. Okay, well, we'll just make do with what the contents of the slide say, because after all, the slide has to direct the con conversation here. I think I did the talk yesterday almost entirely out slides. It worked a lot better. Um, okay, so, so um, the commercial Unix vendors are, are pretty happy with their little consortium, but the problem is, is that these commercial Unix vendors are starting to enter the PC market. They're starting to migrate their hardware from custom graphics hardware co to commodity hardware. They still want to be able to ship their commercial Unix versions on, this, on the commodity hardware, but they're trying to get out of the hardware business. Uh, HP and Sun and DEC at the time are starting to get out of the, uh, the commercial graphics card business, out of the, out of the um, commercial bus business. So they're moving this industry standard architectures, they're moving the industry standard backplanes and, and that kind of stuff. And so all of a sudden, their hardware is moving from stuff that they have control over that's moving really slowly to hardware that's moving very fast. All of a sudden, they aren't able to keep up with the developments and the graphics drivers they need. Who has drivers for this commodity hardware? X386 has drivers for this commodity hardware. So all of a sudden, these commercial Unix vendors have a much more desperate need to be able to track developments in the X world at a faster rate because the hardware is moving too fast for them to keep up with on their own. So they're interested in collaborating more closely with X386 to get um, X386 code into their commercial Unix distributions to support this new hardware. Um, X386, meanwhile, um, is, has, has, is uh, starting to grow as well. X386 is getting a huge influx of new interest and new members who are interested in working beyond the driver level. Um, I joined X386 in 1999, and I'm totally uninterested in graphics drivers. Um, I work slightly above that level doing graphics infrastructure and system, system engineering. Um, there's other, other people working in font design. We had a, a huge influx of, uh, of Unicode support at the, in this time um, from some people in the UK, Mark Leischer, and a bunch of other people at, at the University of New Mexico as well, 
who are interested in getting uh, broader inter internationalization support into the Windows system. So they're working way up in user mode, doing stuff to Xlib to make it support UTF-8 and other Unicode stuff. And there's people working in Xterm, supporting Xterm to make it do all kinds of crazy new stuff. There's people working all over the Windows system. The problem is, is that the membership of the X86 corporation, remember, why did they create this corporation? They created the corporation to join the X consortium in the hopes the X consortium would take their code and ship it, which they never did. So they put the corporation together quickly. It's a Texas corporation. Who would organize a, cor a US corporation in Texas unless they were not interested in long-term viability? Right? It's not a very friendly corporate environment in a lot of ways. They put it together with the minimal bylaws they could to satisfy the requirements of the state of Texas. And the state of Texas required that they have a membership with officers in an election process. So I mean, you know, lots of organizations that we know have membership and officers and election process. The problem was the state of Texas didn't require that they be able to elect new members. So their corporate charter had a fixed membership. Not unusual for a corporation to have membership that is fixed by the people who put the money in. Well, there's not a lot of money here, but the membership of X56 was fixed. All but one of these members, the original founders of X-386, leave the X-386 project and go off and do other stuff. They are still members of the corporation. And in fact, they still run the corporation today. But they have no interest in X. In fact, one of them is working at AOL doing Windows stuff. One of them is off working on telecom stuff. Um, one of them is back to his law practice doing law stuff. They don't have any interest in what's going on in X. They just want to basically be left alone. The remaining member, the only remaining mem member of, um, of the X-86 project, becomes a de facto dictator. He has the only voice in the community which has any authority over the, from the X-86 from a corporate perspective. So in order to say what X-86 wants, there's only one person with a voice there. The uh, charter of the organization, again, put together quickly to satisfy the needs of the state of Texas so they could become a corporation, so they could join the X consortium, so they could get the X consortium to distribute their code. There's no process in the constitution of this corporation for fixing the governance model. Um, I suggested on in a couple of emails that maybe they should consider rewriting their constitution so that we could fix the, the governance model, uh, but they kind of laughed at me. So what happens is because there's no, uh, there's no voice for the community within this project, um, the developers became very unhappy with the direction the leadership was taking. The leadership was shutting down development in a lot of areas. It was not interested in taking over its assumed role. What happened in 19, uh, 1999? X386 takes over the entire X window system. But the de core developers of the project, and in particular the project leader, really is not interested in things beyond the driver level. So he has no interest in managing this very large project. I mean, the X window system is, you know, couple, several million lines of code, of which the core developers were interested in, you know, 10 or 20,000 lines. So the developers outside of this area became very unhappy with the leadership. There were changes that were not getting done. There was no, there was no say in how the project was run. Um, and in fact, because the core developers for the project had had such a bad experience with the X consortium, I mean, here they're paying their money, they're trying to play by the rules, and the corporations laugh at them. The uh, core members are very distrustful of corporate involvement in the Windows system again. And most of these new developers are being sponsored by corporations who are interested in free software development of the Windows system. I was working for SUSE at the time and then HP. Other developers were working for Sun or for Red Hat. Um, so the, the uh, key developers of X386 were very distrustful of this. They were concerned that if they granted any sort of control to corporate sponsored developers, the corporations would again take over the Windows system and they would lose their Windows system again and have to do bad things. So instead of, um, Instead of allowing these new members who have, are sponsored by corporations to gain some measure of control of the project, they kicked the members out of the project. They said, you can no longer commit to the project. You're not welcome to play here. And so we left. Um, and at about the same time, uh, well, the, this core developer, the key developer was, was interested in ensuring that his own name remained uh, associated with the project because he worked on it for a long time. He worked on it for almost 10 years. So he assigned uh, a new license to pieces of the project that were not a non-GPL compatible license. It had an, essentially an advertising clause, just like the BSD license. Slightly different advertising clause, but it was clearly not GPL compatible. And the FSF even put together a little statement that said, this is not a free, uh, GPL compatible license. Um, so at that point, we had a group of developers. The bulk of the developers are no longer franchised within the X386 project. 
We had a credible political reason for no longer shipping X-386. We had um, basically quorum and a credible reason for, for forking the project, so we did. Um, so what we did, in fact, was we hijacked the X.org X name, right? The uh, Linux developers, the free software developers working in the Windows system got together with the small group of Unix system vendors who were still working in X.org and said, what if we got together, because we have a shared common interest, and put together a free software project? You know, reconstituted the organization with a legitimate license, um, with, I mean, with a le legitimate uh, constitution, put together an organization that was run by free software developers for the benefit of the X-Windows system and implementation, and basically created an organization from whole cloth. We used the same name, or a slight variant on the name, it used to be the X.org the X Foundation uh, Consortium, it was an industry consortium, it's now a, been totally reconstituted as a nonprofit educational foundation. So we can take charitable contributions. Uh, we have uh, very strict rules because it's a charitable organization about how we can spend the money and, who, and uh, where the money can come from and who is in charge of the organization. In particular, um, we no longer have corporate control over the uh, politics of the organization. The governance of XORG is entirely elected from within the developer community. It's not elected from within the corporate controllers of the organization. The money has been entirely separated from the development process. You no longer get the sponsors of the organization no longer have any say in the development of the project. The only thing that they can do is if they don't like what the project's doing, they can stop paying. Um, and at this point, with uh, over a quarter million dollars in the bank, it doesn't really worry me too much if they all left because XORG is not exactly an expensive organization to run. So how is XORG put together? Membership is based on work. Uh, you put together a little statement of what you've done for X recently, or what you plan to do for X, and you send it into the XORG membership board. And the me membership board says, oh yeah, this guy's worked on X. You know, he should be a member. What is membership good for? The only thing membership is good for is voting for the, uh, the governance of the organization. There's no, there's no uh, tie between membership and development. Uh, the, we have um, many developers that work, for, that work on X that have no membership. It's a little frustrating to me because I would like them all to be members so they would be able to vote in the, in the, governing, uh, um, uh, in the governing elections. But we decided not to tie those two together because we really wanted to make sure that development wasn't tied to the corporate structure in any way. So we have you know, uh, dozens and dozens of committers uh, who have no interest in the, in the governance of the, uh, the, uh, the organization, which is, like I say, frustrating to me, and I'd like to be able to fix that. Uh, the board is elected by these members, and that's the only thing membership buys you, is the ability to elect the board. Um, the sponsors of the organization are corporations who think that X, uh, XORG is doing a good job and they're willing to put in a little money every year to help the organization thrive. What is the money, good, what is the money used for? Well, right now it's sitting in a bank account. Uh, we haven't really figured out exactly what to do with the money. Uh, it's growing. We're getting more of it every year, which is kind of cool. Uh, but we have not figured out what to do with these resources. And the reason for that is that the sponsors are corporations interested in commercializing the X Windows system, and XORG Foundation is a bunch of free software developers interested in spreading their software through the world for free. So you see right now a, a tension between uh, the free software developers who are running the organization and the sponsors who are putting money in. The sponsors are entirely corporations interested in commercializing the Windows system. Now, so far we haven't really found a good balance of how to make those two groups actually figure out what to do with the money that's uh, pouring into the organization. Um, the board actually controls the bank account. I'm the treasurer of the organization. The board elects on what we spend money on, and I and uh, one or two other people sign the checks. So the sponsors can't spend money. The only people who can spend money is the board. However, we acknowledge that the sponsors are providing the money, and if, they, if we spend monies in the way the sponsors don't like, they'll probably stop providing money. So we're trying to figure out how to do things that the sponsors like that, that are useful for the organization. And so far, we haven't found anything that the sponsors think we should do. We aren't going to do advertising. We aren't going to do, we aren't going to spend a bunch, a bunch of money on paying people to write code, because we've discovered that's a really bad plan. We aren't going to spend money, um, you know, so far the sponsors aren't interested in spending money to get the developers together in any sort of massive way. You know, it seems like one of the key things that a, a free software project can do is to bring developers together. Right? Why do we all come to DebConf? We come to DebConf because it's fun to see our friends and because we connect in a personal way, which really helps the project move forward in a technical way. 
So far, we haven't convinced the sponsors that this would be a good plan for them to spend their money on. So maybe we will. I don't know. But so far, we've spent like maybe $10,000 in the last two years. I could check the checkbook, but yeah, it's kind of amazing. So I have piles of money, nothing to do with it. Okay, so what's the result of this grand, glorious political adventure? Um, we have a lot of new contributors. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of new interest and uh, progress being made in the Windows system, a lot, and uh, things are expanding a lot of different fronts. One of the obvious advantages of having, uh, of letting pretty much anybody who has a cool idea into the pool of people who are organizing, organizing what gets shipped is that you get interesting new technology, and sometimes you get multiple implementations of similar technology. So right now we have both the XGL and AIGLX in the source code, and people are experimenting with these two systems to try to figure out what's the right way to, to move the Windows system forward. Um, we have changed the release process from everything, it used to be that everything that, was in the, uh, everything that was in the source code system got shipped. You know, you basically, if you wanted, if you, um, if you were willing to accept source code maintenance for the project, you were committing to ship the project. And we figured out that that was probably not a great plan because there's a huge amount of new technology and a huge amount of competing projects and it's, it's important to provide hosting for them and to provide a place for them to collaborate, but it's not required that we commit to that being a part of the Windows system implementation as a standard. Right, so we're able to ship things like XGL and AIGLX and say, well yeah, sure those are competing implementations of a similar idea. We don't really say either one of those is standard. So in, 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 uh, there's a whole bunch of other code going into the repository right now that we aren't even going to ship at all. It's just sitting in the repository. The release manager says, oh, that stuff's not quite ready to ship yet, and we don't ship it. But it's in the repository so people can see it. We have a shared collaboration environment that doesn't demand that everything in that environment be part of the release. There are major structural changes, of course, uh, that, have under, that have happened in the last couple of years in terms of development model and politics. The main thing that I like about it is it's a nice place to play now. Uh, X386 used to be kind of a hostile environment because there was this, you know, there's this very clear hierarchy of the, the key developer followed by kind of a, a, a cabal of uh, central, um, central committers followed by the, the plebeian committers who had no access to the repository. We've flattened it out now so that anybody who has credible, uh, credible uh, ideas is allowed to commit directly to the repository and get their changes in without, uh, significant, re without significant roadblocks in their way. And that's really helped it become a lot more friendly place to play. It's like, well, sure, if you want to do some work, go ahead. Here's uh, commit access to the repository. Have a good time. Let us know if you have any questions. Okay, so what lessons did we learn? Well, we learned at the start of the project that quick fixes to problems, uh, to temporary problems, have very long-term consequences. The, uh, the foundation of the X consortium was um, predicated on the lack of a viable internet. So here we have 20 years of political history that are basically uh, uh, caused by a short-term technological failure, right? X386 and uh, S S uh, GCS, those two organizations that formed corporations to join the consortium, were forced into joining that and made very short-term decisions on how to join that organization and the consequences of those uh, um, led to their long-term organizational failures. Uh, SGCS right now has not a significant market and not a significant contribution to the X Windows system, even though Thomas Roll was the first author of all this code that we're now shipping. Um, so what we've tried to do with the reinstantiation of the X, uh, of Xorg is put together a credible organization that will survive in the long term and I'm hoping survive beyond uh, even my participation in the project. Um, so when you're doing fixes, short-term fixes to a short-term problem, understand they have long-term consequences. Um, and the main thing is to have the main contributors stay involved in the political process of the organization because the political process really does uh, push how the technology is distributed and how the technology is implemented. So if you, want the pro if you want the process to stay, the project to stay open and the project to stay functional and the technology to stay viable, you need to stay involved in the political process of the organization to keep the project in and uh, to keep the project shipping good free software. So I think that's the end of my presentation. We have questions and comments. Yeah. One question. You said lessons learned for the X um, project. What of these lessons do, uh, do also apply to the Debian project in your opinion and how to fix them, if so? Uh, 
I think the key lesson that I'd like to bring to my friends in the Debian community is that um, governance matters a huge amount. And that if the developers abdicate their, uh, pro their involvement in the political process, the project will move away from their goals. And that the only way to make sure that te technological and social goals of the project are put forward is to make sure that the people that have those goals are involved in the process. You can't abdicate responsibility and expect other developers to want to do what you want to do. So, yeah, keep voting, keep involved. Other questions? Excellent. We're only seven minutes behind schedule now. Question? What do you see happening over the next few years with drivers that are currently closed sourced by provided by uh, NVIDIA and ATI maybe? Well, I don't know. I'm working at Intel right now precisely because I'm hoping that Intel will be able to continue shipping credible open source drivers and as the Intel hardware incre increases in performance, I'm hoping a couple things. As Linux becomes more viable desktop for a wider variety of people and, and the Linux desktop market grows, that the general interest and the general amount of money available in that market will grow as well, right? The goal, the, my goal here is to make it so that with ha having at least one open source vendor is that we're going to be able to push the market to understanding the difference between free software drivers and closed source drivers and have the market start choosing free software. Um, the only way that I can see to impact NVIDIA and ATI is to hurt them in the bottom line, is to make it clear that their participation in the free software desktop market is predicated on their willingness to participate in the free software environment, including their drivers. And so I'm hoping to pressure the market to the point where Intel's, Intel's market share, which is already dominant in the desktop, becomes overwhelming, and ATI and NVIDIA realize that if they want to take a piece of this business, they're going to have to be more open. So that's my goal, is to, is to make that happen. I don't think that there's any other way we can force them to do it. I know the Linux kernel people are trying to shut down the ability to ship closed source kernel drivers. Um, I think that will have, um, I think at this point, if they, were, if they did it completely at this point, we would end up in a situation where ATI and NVIDIA might just walk away. Um, that's my concern, is that we can't be, we can't push them too fast or they'll just, they'll just say, I, if we can't play in this market, we can't play in this market, we're going to give up on this you know, tiny fraction of our overall budget, o overall market. So I don't think we can play too much hardball right now, but I think in about five or ten mm -hmm. years, when the market has grown significantly, we're going to be able to play a lot nastier and push the issue a lot harder. So I just want to make sure that there are some open source drivers, that it's clear that the market is interested in free software, and that uh, if they want to play, they're going to have to play by our rules and the development of open source alternatives to the currently closed source drivers. Do you see that as a viable option? Do, is there enough information available or can we get the information out of the cards in some way that, that those drivers will be of enough quality to compete with the closed source drivers? Um, actually, the, it is very surprising how far the R300 project has come. Uh, the R300 project started as a, a totally reverse engineering the hardware, um, and they've done a, a, a surprisingly good job in getting support for those cards. Uh, one of the problems is that it just takes a huge amount of effort, a huge amount of additional effort on top of the already um, overwhelming task of putting together a credible driver to do the reverse engineering necessary to put together a real driver. The other thing is that it takes a lot of time. Right? right now, I at Intel can offer to ship drivers for new chipsets within 90 days of the chipset delivery, which means that when you buy a new laptop, as long as, if you buy a brand new laptop with a brand new Intel chipset, you know that you'll be able to run Linux soon on it because the drivers will be available. The reverse engineering process for the R300, the R300 is like three years old now, and it's just barely becoming usable. So one of the big problems with reverse engineering effort is while we can produce credible drivers for that hardware, we can't produce them fast, right? I'm right now working on drivers for the next generation of Intel graphics. You, you, you can't even get silicon for those. You know, there's no open source driver that has one of these chips. They don't exist outside of Intel, right? So I can actually put together drivers that ship 
um, on the day, that are ready to ship on the day of ship delivery. And with a closed source driver, with a reverse engineered driver, it takes a lot more time. So as much as it would be nice to say that we can reverse engineer and do anything, um, the fact is that the hardware market moves so fast is that we, we end up with smaller and smaller slice of the effective market as you end up with a smaller and smaller slice of the effective product lifetime. Any more questions? Yep. Some years earlier, ACLI used to ship um, up drivers. Yeah, why don't they anymore? Maybe. Okay. Yeah, I will. A few years ago, ATI used to ship open source drivers, and it seemed they are completely stepping back from this. Are there political reasons behind this? <coughs> the question is. ATI used to ship open source drivers and they don't anymore. Why, is, why the change? They, they offer a lot of different reasons. Um, I think one of the most telling reasons is that they, they were shipping open source drivers before NVIDIA was in this market, before NVIDIA was participating in the free software environment. Um, they were free software drivers for early eight NVIDIA chips as well. It seems that at a particular point in both of these companies' uh, hardware development cycles, they somehow got it in their little brains that they had magic stuff in their hardware. Whether, the, you know, all of a sudden their hardware changed. In ATI's case, it was um, ATI purchased another company and totally revamped their hardware architecture. The R300 series has a totally different 3D engine than the R200 series. It's mo much more programmable. They somehow got it in their heads that this was somehow special, right? And so they stopped, they said, well, there are a lot of different reasons they offer. Uh, one of the reasons that we've been given uh, publicly, I don't know how much to believe, one of the reasons we've been given publicly is that they believe that they may be violating NVIDIA's patents and that by shipping the driver source code, it would make it easier for NVIDIA to stop their ship, uh, the delivery of hardware in the Windows market. The other reason that we've been given is that documentation is expensive and difficult to produce. Uh, that's certainly true at Intel. Um, it, documentation is a lot of money to produce. I've actually been told by an NVIDIA engineer that they have no documentation for their hardware. Yeah, that the way they do driver and hardware development is that the hardware and software engineers work in the same area and they collaborate together on the development of the hardware and the development of the software in tandem so that there is no actual documentation for how the hardware works other than the driver. In NVIDIA's case, uh, that driver came from source code. They don't have the license to distribute. So in other words, the only documentation they have is the, is the, uh, is the source code that they can't ship. Um, I'm just relaying a question from IRC um, from Jonas Meyer. He asks, what can we do instead of using old hardware that free drivers are available for? After, after all, we, if we don't buy any graphics cards, we are not seen in the statistics. Right. So how do, we, how do we grow the market? Well, right now, the only way that you can play in the market is to buy Intel graphics hardware. <laughs> yeah, it sucks to be me, doesn't it? Um, and, and to buy legacy hardware. Um, I don't know. I mean, it really is the case right now that the only way you can have a credible free software desktop is to buy Intel chipsets. Um, I'd like that not to be the case, uh, but it realistically is. You can, what? Okay, another, another, okay, go ahead. Oh, okay, yeah, um, okay. I guess we're out of time today. Thanks all for coming up this morning. Enrico, do you have a comment? Oh, no, I was just wondering if we could ship any classic to AMD or Intel so that they get the hang of what they, they connect to. Hi. I wonder if we could ship this chunk of video to ATI and NVIDIA marketing people saying, like, this guy can go to the software conference and say, buy Intel stuff, it's cool, it works, and you can't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is nice to be able to come up and say that we do have open source drivers for all of our hardware. So that's a, a, nice, that's a nice thing for Intel to be able to do.
And I'd also like to uh, publicly thank Richard Stallman for, uh, for, uh, pr for, um, for uh, uh, protesting at ATI, a recent ATI event at MIT that helped me in my position at Intel significantly. So thanks very much today.